Yo. Welcome to I'm Not Joking, the podcast where a behavioral scientist examines what it's like to live a humorous life. Glimpse into the lives of the funniest people in entertainment, business, and science as your host, Dr. Peter McGraw, explores their habits, motivations, and secrets to success. Get ready to fire up your brain and your funny bone. Now, here's your host. Welcome to I'm Not Joking, the podcast that looks at the lives of funny people. I'm Peter McGraw. Today's guest is Barnett Kelman. Barnett is the Robin Williams Endowed Chair in Comedy at USC School of Cinematic Arts, where he's a professor of directing and founder and co-director of USC's comedy program. He's even better known for directing theater and television, specializing in comedy, of course. He's received two Emmy Awards and seven Emmy nominations for his work directing the television show Murphy Brown. Welcome, Barnett. Glad to be here. So if you weren't working as a director or a professor, what would you be doing with your life? If I wasn't working as a director or professor, I expect I would be writing. Writing? Writing what? Well, if I were really free, (laughs) uh, (laughs) no, I, I would, I would first of all be writing something I've been trying to uh, work on for a long time, which is the book that shares the process that I have found inhabits my work. I, I, like most professionals, you know, you do it mm-hmm. and you learn as you're doing it and you do it as many years as I've done it. And you learn and know a lot more than you even know, you know, and you do things that you would describe as instinctual, instinctively, you just see things in a certain way. You see the ball coming in a certain way. Mm-hmm. Um, that's called being a pro after a while. Isn't there a, there's like a famous story about, it's not Lou Gehrig, Mickey Mount Mantle. Shoot. Ted. Williams. Williams. Yeah. Most natural hitter, probably. Uh, and that he had a. He had arranged the batter's, what's that called? The box, Mm -hmm. basically, that you strike. Oh, my God, I'm screwing this up. Well, you're not a baseball fan, I'm not a, I used to be. Okay, so, well, essentially, this is like. He analyzed the strike zone? The strike zone. Yeah. And he had 50 or 100 different parts of the strike zone that he would adjust his swing differently based upon where the ball was in the strike zone. This is, right. this is sort of that idea that you get so advanced. Yeah, I know very, very much so. I, the question, of course, that comes to everybody's mind and pertains very heavily to comedy is every time you hear about anything like that, and that's an amazing story, if mm-hmm. that's you know accurate. Ted Williams probably would be the guy because he was he was the one that was said to said to be, you know, the genius of hitting. But, you know, the question is, can you think and do it at this is the thing at the same time? Mm-hmm. Do you actually think as you do it? And, and, and it depends on what we mean by think. Right. If we mean, do we slow down and say words to ourselves inside our head? Probably that's just thought moving slower mm-hmm. than somebody like Ted Williams, who I connect. But he, after the fact, I would guess that after the fact, he figured out what he was doing that's right it's that like reverse worked engineer. exactly and then the question is probably and this is my guess and this is the actually the underlying theory behind what i do right now in my teaching there as you said reverse engineering the the purpose of it would be twofold because you can't actually you're not actually doing it as you work but the purpose would be twofold one would be the ability to share it with others mm-hmm which most people who do something like comedy don't actually do, yes. not in any analytic way. They do it by being together, like some kind of ur primitive jazz musicians. They play with one another, right? and they learn from one another by playing together. And that is the primary way that we learn. You know, it's the primary way we learn anything. You know, we learn to be human. We yeah. learn to be social animals. That's all very well and good, but at a certain time... There's a value in knowing what the process was that got you to be, say, most human. Mm-hmm. And, and, and besides it being useful for sharing, it's also extremely useful when something breaks down. 
Mm-hmm. When you know when it's working, you don't need to analyze anything. Mm-hmm. But s- when something is not working, if you know the strike zone, going back to Ted Williams, mm-hmm. if you know if you have metrics by which you can work, you can say, "What am I doing that's breaking the fundamentals?" Mm-hmm. Well, so okay, so let's step back for a second. So you so you've directed live theater television and that was sort of the order you started in theater yeah it's a weird jumping around order De- totally started in theater that okay. part is simple started in theater all kinds of theater not particularly in comedy mm-hmm. uh, at all directors in theater never well they rarely specialize that way okay. you know they think of themselves as really generalists you do whatever the script you know requires and as happens, I found myself through your career talks to you. Mm-hmm. Your career tells you where you're going. <laughs> you get answers from the universe, as it were. You put stuff out there and you start to get answers. And one answer I got was that people appreciated and valued my work most directing the premiere productions of new plays. Okay. So that was my first specialty. That's how I found out that most of my career was going to be in New York City and not in the hinterlands doing revivals. That So I, I, I grew up with a generation of, of terrific playwrights, you know, like David Rabin, John Patrick Shanley, and Donald Margulies, and doing the first productions, new productions, premiere productions of their of their plays, and Kevin Wade and Lee Kalsheim. And so that's what I was doing in New York. And... One day, one of those plays really ran, you know, became a hit and ran for a year. And that was Key Exchange by Kevin Wade, who went on to write Working Girl, which was nominated for Best Picture Oscar and, you know, many, many other things and on to a great career. But he was a brand new, it was his first play, Neophyte Playwright. And Shanley's first play, Danny and the Deep Blue Sea, was something that I directed the first production of. So those plays had a a comic element to them. And I started to get, critics started to pick up on this. I started to get noticed for comedy. And when I got noticed for comedy, I started to get offered more comedy. Okay. And I started to do more comedy. And before I knew it, I, well, I loved it, first of all. I mean, that that's the simplest part is... I mean, you must have if you're life. already sort of naturally putting it... I had, been, it I had been an actor first. I started off as an actor. I stopped myself I stopped myself from acting. I joined Equity when I was 19 as an actor, and, and I stopped myself from acting because I was afraid that if I went on acting, people would never let me direct. And I knew I wanted to direct. I, I just knew that. So I stopped my own acting career short. But even in my acting career, my biggest successes, I couldn't help but be funny on stage. That's what everybody always said. And so there, I mean, it became apparent that I had some kind of instinct for it. Mm-hmm. So, and I loved doing it. So I did that. And um, you asked about television came by accident into my life. It, it came up as a bread job. A producer saw a producer, a very ambitious producer of, of a soap opera in New York, saw an off-Broadway production that I had directed. And he asked me if I wanted to train to direct his soap. And I had no thought of it. I'd never really watched a soap opera. But, you know, I was a starving artist directing mm-hmm. theater in New York. And this was a this, this is in the, This is in the 70s? This is in the 70s. Okay. Uh, in a tough time in New York. Yeah, yeah. And All, all American cities were sort of yeah, exactly. struggling. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And his particular thing was that he would hire whatever actors were the biggest stars on Broadway at the moment, whoever had a great play running or something like that, Morgan Freeman, whoever it was, Colleen Dewar, he would hire her. He would hire them for his soap uh-huh. and put them on a limited uh-huh. run on his soap. Smart. That's smart. Exactly. And then he got these fabulous actors on his soaps and he started to say, I need directors that can talk to them. It's not enough to have the technicians who I have, you I know, see shooting just shooting them i need they they come in they need they want somebody to talk to them Mm -hmm. and when you say talk to them do you mean manage their egos no no well no yes and no but no 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 these are theater actors okay they have a process it's not just say the lines i see it's and 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 this producer paul roush had more taste than that he he appreciated terrific performance and 
you know, you couldn't tell him, hey, you're just doing a soap opera, Paul. <laughs> if Paul wanted it to be, you know, yeah, art. I see. And so he then started to train directors from the theater to direct his soap opera. Okay. And and work with I these see. terrific actors that he was putting up on screen. So that's where you learned. So that's where I learned how to do multiple camera technique. Mm-hmm. And that's where I learned editing. But all of that was still a, uh, in the realm of a bread job, a way of, of supporting my, my theater habit. And then when this play Key Exchange became a hit, as I said, it, it subsequently got sold to the movies. It took a while while they chased around a lot of Hollywood directors. And one day they came back to me and said, you know, we've been thinking about this and we want to do this. You know, how about we do this with the guy who directed the play that got us interested in the first place. And uh, that became my first feature film. So I learned kind of on the job. Yeah. So I I have a lot of questions for you about this stuff. And especially, I think the audience probably really doesn't know what television director or theater director does in in many ways. So first thing I want to, my observation is this interesting thing about you specializing in new, you know, so one of the things that you've done, so I think most of your acclaim comes from Murphy Brown, which you directed for many, many seasons, but you've also directed a lot of pilots, a lot of comedy pilots. Yeah, my television career, I mean, I have done other things. I I directed ER and I directed Alias and mm-hmm. I directed Ally McBeal, none of which uh, in those cases, I, in the middle, more recently, those cases I was stepping in to a, 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 an episodic as an epi- guest in episodic television. Mm-hmm. But most of my career, that those were all sidelights, as it were, anomalies. Most of my television career and the part that I enjoyed the most was directing pilots. And, and so tell me, like, so so you were saying you were doing these new plays and you do these new TV shows as a pilot. Like, what is it? Why do you like doing them? Why were you good at it? Well, you, I mean, in a way, you've gone right to the heart of the matter. The truth of the matter is that the, at the time in the 70s, there was almost no television in New York whatsoever. Television had died and moved out of New York. Okay. It was entirely on the West Coast. And every now and then they would come and for various reasons, usually because somebody wanted to live in New York, they would do a show. They would do a series Uh out of New York, in which case they always brought the directors from Los Angeles because they didn't feel like they were trained directors in New York. And I still was just looking for something that paid better than theater to support my theater. Okay. Um, so that was my only interest in television at that particular time. But then a young man got the job named Greg Mayday, got the job as head of comedy development at CBS. Okay. And he had a theater background and he got the unusual notion, just like this, uh, I, you know, I've been the beneficiary of, uh, of, of, uh, some unusual notions from some talented people. The first case was the soap producer who mm-hmm. decided to hire theater people to direct. Uh, Greg Mayday thought that a new play uh, is the same thing as a pilot. That's clever. The director's job is to create the manifest, the world that comes off the page. Right. You know, there are many, many decisions that have to be made and then carried out forever mm-hmm. based in that first template show the casting Mm -hmm. and the tone the pace the look Mm -hmm. everything comes off of that first realization and he said the job of a director directing a comedy pilot on network television is really the same as the job of a director a smart observation so he hired me straight out of new york to pilot to do pilots a couple of pilots for cbs and um that was unheard of that was really a radical move. The, the cadre of pilot directors was, was a very small, very select and separate list than episodic directors. Okay. At the time, it was not something you went back and forth. You were either pilot director or an episodic uh-huh. director. And breaking into that pilot list was a kind of a mysterious process. And you certainly didn't get there in one jump. Okay. But basically, that's what Greg did with me. He jumped me into the business. And fortunately, in that first season of pilots that I did, a couple of them went well. And then in the second season of pilots that I did, I got Murphy Brown on the air. Yeah, that's great. And that was a game changer for me. 
And so you might do multiple pilots within a season? I did. I would do up to four pilots in a season. Oh, wow, that's a lot. So I want to, we'll get back to your writing because I think this is all leading to that. So I want to ask you a little bit about, so I had an earlier conversation with an, with a comedian, actress, and we talked a little bit about theater versus television acting and a little bit about directing. So it's, this is a nice compliment to that conversation. So how is it that, so you, you mentioned learning about editing, right? So that's one major difference between theater directing and television directing, right? So theater directing, you all the direct, most of the directing is done before the show starts and then the show starts and you're, you, you trust in the actors. Yes. In television directing, you're doing takes and scenes. And so you're doing some kind of like live editing is not the right word, but you're doing, you know, you're, you're doing some assembling and changing and stuff. And then, you know, in post, you're going to arrange all this stuff, put it all together. How does that change well, the way you direct? Well, there are lots of, <laughs> it's a lots of different steps here that you. Yes, I know. Yeah. <laughs> um, but no, no. But first of all, my transition, my initial transition was how to put this kind of more logical in that when I said I started, first thing I did on camera was soaps. Mm -hmm. In those days, there was no editing. Is that right? Right. It was called live for tape. It uh, was. So it, it felt like so. It like was theater. recorded, uh -huh. but it was recorded in real time. Interesting. And all the scene changes and everything, and because it was a stage-bound medium primarily. Okay. All the changes that the show went through, which means changes of time, changes of set, changes of costume, okay. were performed in real time, like in a play. Really? Absolutely. A very interesting, funny, now archaic, yeah. nostalgic process. It was exactly like live television. No difference at all. As a matter of fact, we would roll in when we would get to a commercial break. Mm -hmm. We would sit there in real time. For the three minutes, let's say, that the commercials would play. Okay. And we would roll in what they call black. Okay. We would be rolling recording black that the network later on would superimpose no the commercials wow. on. So it was a very real process. So the way you the day would work on a soap opera is you'd come in. It was just a lightning process. Okay. It was like doing a play. Okay. But a lightning plot process okay. with no time for rewrites. There, there's a big difference. Mm -hmm. Then when you're doing a new play, first production of a new play, you're not only working with the actors to realize it, but you're also working with the playwright to develop the script because it hasn't been proven yet. Mm -hmm. On a soap opera, there's no time for that. You shoot what was written. But we'd start at seven in the morning with rehearsals. Okay. And then we would go through, the, then we would move down to the stage and stage it and then camera block it and then, re and then do a dress rehearsal. And then we would do this show. Yeah, wow. So it was a very theatrical process, uh -huh. just very, very quick. And the editing, of course, of course, the audience's attention, instead of, instead of the audience having the option in a, in a proscenium universe to look uh, as on stage, to look where they want to look, although good staging in the theater does direct your attention right. via the staging. Mm -hmm. But in this case, of course, you're actually getting to change the camera angle. Mm -hmm. But you're doing that in real time. So you're throwing up four shots at a time and selecting among them. And, and the process that I had to learn, which, as I said, was a famous old lightning process mm -hmm. developed you know, some years before by the original pioneers of, of television mm -hmm. and live TV was literally where you're watching for cameras and snapping your fingers to indicate when to cut between shots and change angles. Right. So as to direct the audience's attention and to build the drama and stuff like that. So huh. what it did was, was it forced me into thinking editorial thinking and compositional thinking and everything in warp speed. Okay. And it's the kind of nightmarish process and scary <laughs> tightrope act that once you, and because it's live and because you can't fix it mm -hmm. and your mistakes are forever. Once you get through it, you, you develop a certain amount of confidence yes, yes, that you yes. know something about what you're doing. When I made the transition then to feature film, 
how to learn yet another discipline. That's more like what you were talking yes, about, right. where you're really relying on post. Mm-hmm. Even even the sitcom pilots, the half hour comedy pilots that I was initially brought to L.A. to do, they had some differences from the soap. Okay, but some of them were shot quite exactly in the same manner as the soap, mm-hmm. live on tape. However, there was an ability. There was an ability out here to edit them. Can I ask you a question about that? Yeah. So I think I think this sort of so to me it sounds like what you've gone through created an advantage that you had, right? Because I think that being able to quote fix it in post unquote can make people lazy. And and then you know the exactly. problem with post is that you it's hard to go you can't go back oftentimes. It's hard to go back. So if if you've learned that you need to have everything right because there is no editing and you carry those skills over to when you have editing, it creates an even greater advantage. Exactly. Yeah. And, 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 and theater directing also has a tremendous being trained to direct for theater, Mm -hmm. to work with act, to direct actors for theater Mm -hmm. has also has an an enormous advantage in the sense that you're midwifing a performance and you're doing it in such a way you're building it you're working with the actors to build it in such a way that it will last over time. Oh, interesting. Instead of being a disposable. Yeah. It's not a question of getting it once. It's, it's a question of finding the right moment. That's so right and inevitable that it can be repeated many, many, many times. Yeah. And you're also ultimately turning it over to the actor. So you're trying to guide them in a certain way in which as it grows in their hands and as you lose control over it, Hopefully, it's still something you would recognize as what you wanted to see to begin with. Mm-hmm. So that's that's the goal, as opposed to the potential advantage that one has that can be abused, of course, that one has in doing, say, feature film or single camera comedy or, you know, half hour, hour drama, it doesn't matter, which is that you only have to get it once and you can kind of get lucky or you can cast somebody that's not really an actor yes, and, right. you know, cut together a performance that works under the circumstances, but is not replicable and the person can't. Yeah. Is it, is it fair to say that in general theater actors are much stronger actors than television or film for that reason, that they have more control, that they have to be more They trusted. have different, ki- look, they have different kind of acting chops. Okay. They have different kind of acting chops. They have definitely different day in and day out chops. Now, people who are really, truly great film actors. They can transform. They, they also, de- no, they also develop a set of skills in relation to the filmmaking process. Yeah, the reason... You know, theater actors, although they... Like everything else, it, you know, this, you, there's no free lunch here. You know, <laughs> wh- wherever you start your process, okay. your journey into a profession, you develop certain muscles. Yeah. And the muscles you develop for, for your initial task will always be your strongest. And you'll have to acquire, develop other muscles as you add di- other disciplines to your thing. And they'll always be playing catch up. So if you start off, for example, as a director, as somebody who's like a a photographer, for example, Mm -hmm. you could start your career as a film director as a still photographer and develop a great eye, you know, and a great visual composition sense. And you're going to have to acquire skills of working with actors and working with techs and stuff like that along the way to become the complete package. And it'll be amazing if 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 you get really good at at those things i just said yes. that'll be wonderful but it's probably probably your 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 selling point is always going to somehow be the thing you started with your eye in the case of the visual artist in my case it'll always be the skills that a theater director has i see so the the reason i i asked that question was you know you you watch a movie and or a tv show and someone from a different discipline a musician Justin Timberlake or Lady Gaga or Common show up on screen and they do a competent job. It's difficult for me to imagine them doing as competent a job in the in live theater, you know, because the great benefit, as you said, is you can do multiple takes and you can edit it and you can make someone I've look actually as never good thought, as possible. I've actually never thought about that, but I would say it's impossible. I mean, I've yes. had to, I've had 
the opportunity to, I was about to say, I've had to work with, I, <laughs> I had the great honor to have worked with a lot. I've directed a lot of NBA stars, uh-huh. NFL stars, yeah. people that they I saw yeah. LeBron James in uh, Trainwreck. Yeah. And it wasn't bad. I got to no, know. I, I think we have to put an asterisk on this. Okay. I think LeBron James in Trainwreck was a genius. It was, now, it was I'm, quite I'm good. ready to work with LeBron. LeBron James. He has some actor. comedy. Put that out there. I want to work with <laughs> LeBron James. That's different. Yeah, I'm not talking about Le- LeBron James. I will refrain from naming famous Got basketball it. players <laughs> who simply can't act, who I have to somehow integrate in because the network wants the stunt of having you know, a Chicago Bull walk into the, yes. the ER on ER and they can promote that one clip and I got to make yeah. him look like he can say a few lines. It's interesting you say this. There's a um, there's been this State Farm series of commercials that have Chris Paul in them. who's the Houston Rockets point guard and they have added James Harden and James Harden is, you know, has become a bit of a, a thing. He's got this big bushy beard. He's he's besides being a great basketball player. He has this interesting brand. He's noticeable. But I think the guy has zero personality, like nothing. Whoever directed this recent commercial, there's no talking in it. It's all voiceover work. So mm-hmm. they all stand there. They're all standing there. Right. And then there's voiceover work about their conversation. It's supposed to be, we know each other so well, we don't even have to talk. Right. And I have to assume they're like, oh my God, what do I do with this total dud? <laughs> How do I make this interesting? Yeah. And it was a clever yeah. directorial decision to do that exactly and i I don't come from that world at all you know Mm -hmm. i i I actually i actually had to learn i come from like live the live world i come from the circus Mm -hmm. i come from when you see a stunt it's somebody doing the real thing Mm -hmm. and then i've had to learn oh there are a lot of ways we can fake this and trick this and you can go in some ways much farther into the land of fantasy, you know, yes. that people enjoy seeing through the trickery of the camera and right. the editing process. I've had to learn all that. My first inclination is always to find out how do we really do this first? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That makes good sense. Yeah. Okay. So there's so many things I want to talk to you about. So, okay. So you become through this process and this is, you know, using your advantages and using your experience and, you know, these things differentiate you and you're good. So you continue to get work and get better. And and then you have this long run with Murphy Brown. But at some point in time in life, you decide you want a real job. I'm teasing. But you decide you're going to become a professor. You're going to wind <laughs> down the te- you're going to wind down the directing and you're going to start you're going to start teaching. You're L.A. based now then, you know, for a while. And um, we were chatting before about how you lost your East Coast ability to deal with the cold. So you've been here for a long time. Yeah, I'm sitting here. My hands are freezing, <laughs> which is ridiculous. And I'm going to shortly pull out. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so exactly. so you, you become a professor. And, and that's how I got to know you. I, I basically I was like, there's a comedy program at USC. I need to meet these guys. So for the listeners, I basically forced my friendship on Barnett. He didn't realize I was doing it, but that's what I've done. And it's been a good one. <laughs> and so now you're a professor. How is being a professor in teaching different than being a director in directing? Yeah, it's a very good question. The truth of the matter is that there's a, a real overlap on the on the skill set. Okay. A real overlap on the skill set. I use a term intentionally that I really believe in, but that has a degree of modesty built into it. And that is uh, when I'm working with actors, I I talk about, I talk about the director as midwife. Okay. Yeah. You've used that already earlier. I do. And I talk, I talk to my students that way. And my reason for you're guiding. (laughs) Yeah. yeah, I mean, you're not. and, And my reason for doing that is to try to inculcate a certain amount of humility in directors Mm-hmm. which does not come naturally to the people who opt to be directors. I see. Yeah. So if the stereotype is, you know, there's a certain amount of ego and ego maniacalness <laughs> to the directing personality, I, I try to remind myself and now my students 
that somebody else is doing every job. Okay. Every identifiable job that the audience gets benefit from, every job that's got you could put your hand on, mm-hmm. is being done by somebody else. Okay. The actors. Right. Are doing the actions right. and saying the, the words. Lighting people, the writer this, wrote the this, script. Yeah. The lighting people the are music. lighting. Somebody else is shooting. And da 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 da. So uh-huh. what the hell else? What is the? <laughs> I mean, do we really get the big bucks for saying action and cut? Uh-huh. I can't be exactly that, but we clearly, among some other things, one of the biggest things we do is try to elicit from all these different artists. Mm-hmm their best and get the best out of them that they have to offer in the telling of a particular story. That's what we're doing. Yeah, I think. And okay, so that's the, so I call it midwifing. Okay. But inevitably there's a certain amount of what you could call teaching. Mm -hmm. And I think at various times, directors have thought of themselves as teachers and not been kind of afraid to act like teachers, you know, in the theater, in the best theaters in the 30s in America, it was common for for the director, and sometimes still in England, for the director at the beginning of a rehearsal process, for the director at the beginning of a rehearsal process to lecture the cast for a few days oh, on really? the meaning of the of the play and on the social history you know, behind it and, and, and all, all things that would inf- supposedly inform the work. And, and directors were not shy about mm-hmm. teaching, right? There's a real overlap is what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. So I, I would never say or act like I'm teaching actors on a set, but I'm doing a lot of things that good teachers yeah, do. Yeah, I think that's right. I'm encouraging inquiry. I'm encouraging exploration. I'm encouraging their process. Mm-hmm. I'm throwing in things. I'm sneaking in ideas that I hope that they will find to be their own or make their own. You're giving and, feedback. I mean, that's one. Totally that's a feedback. lot. Feedback. I'm a lot giving of, critique. Mm-hmm. You know, hope constructive critique. So there's a tremendous natural overlap between the two processes. Mm-hmm. And you know, at a certain point in my life, after after having done it on sets and on stage for so long, I kind of really was ready to sort of come out and, you know, just do it straight ahead. Yeah. And, and so and be able and and say, hey, look, you know, I'm your teacher. <laughs> so I've sat in on your class um, once. Uh, so you did. So you I, did. I did. And I'm so terrible because I'm sitting in this class with a bunch of 20 something under USC undergrads. I remember now. And I keep raising my hand and asking <laughs> questions and contributing. Like I'm just this random dude who just dropped into one class. I just can't help myself. Like I was so enthralled by the ideas in there, even without the full context, you know, of the class. So you teach directing the comedy. That's your yeah. class. Yeah. You have a dozen 20 students or something 15 15, 15 students 15 is the there. good number and this is getting back to your our conversation to, at the beginning about writing so you're teaching them your style of directing the comedy directing or directing I, I would comedy. say i would say my process your process no, my for directing them. they hopefully have their own styles but i'm teaching a way of thinking about the work yes. and a way of approaching the work and i and and i make a real point at the beginning and reiterated as many times as necessary that I am teaching my process. Mm -hmm. I am teaching something that evolved over time that I found suited me and who I am. And that has proved successful for one director name, whose name is Barnett. It may or may not be the process for them, but it's good to have a place to begin. Indeed. And it's good to have a coherent process to work with and to try out as one is essentially and inevitably going to invo- evolve and develop one's own process. They will each, if they're to be directors, have to ultimately rewrite the book for themselves. Yes. But how do you begin? And the truth of the matter is that there's not a lot of teaching of directing anywhere, directing period, yes. anywhere at any, compared to other disciplines, it's under instructed. There aren't that many, even theater schools that have directing programs. They all have acting programs. Mm-hmm. Many have playwriting programs. There's very few that teach directing. 
Three and then comedy. even fewer that teach direct none, comedy. None, none, zero, right. none. Yeah. That was the big, that was the market. That's high, you're highly what, differentiated. You're, you're the guy who knows. So what's the, mar- the market absence, the space on the shelf yes. that was empty that I saw, that I knew that there was no such thing as a course in directing comedy and, anywhere. Yes. And there's demand for it, too. That's the key is there are plenty of reasons there's empty space on the shelves is no one wants the imaginary thing that's there. The key is there's demand for this thing that doesn't exist. So when I was in your class, I'm going to, I may use the wrong words, forgive me, Mm. but I remember you talking about looking for these emotional moments or moments of what, what is the phrase you use? Moments. 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 So in, so you were doing an exercise where people had a portion of a script from a pilot that you had shot and they were trying to identify the moment, these moments of emotion powerful moments does this sound familiar yeah oh you know, yeah and it, then you and the, and so we were debating and talking about where they are and then you were it's identifying the moments yes. in other words what and 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 and, and i you know it's she was. I'm pretty impressed. I remembered that. <laughs> no, very good. No, it's essential. It, it's actually, you know, you're, it's like saying the atom. To yeah. say a moment is like saying the I atom see. is saying the smallest, most In basic, physics, yeah. basic particle, okay. right? I mean, that's how much of I know about physics. Is people out there presumably <laughs> saying the atom is not the most basic. What about the? Yeah, you know, it's like, I don't, know. don't but, worry. You know, when I was a kid, the atom was very important. <laughs> that I remember. Um, <laughs> so just for just for the context, I, I, I want to take away the word powerful and emotional okay. because a moment is just something is markable. Fair. Oh yes. Okay. Fair. That's fair. Okay. It, it doesn't have to come in the package of some, as you say, strong emotion, okay. but it has to, it there's has to land. There. There's, there's meaning. Something, yeah. There's something that stops us or breaks our rhythm mm-hmm. to a certain extent. Something lands in a moment. So what you were doing was, which I enjoyed quite a lot, is from a script. So I think, you know, for, for a lot of people listening they're not familiar with, you know, a director takes these written words and then turns them into words and actions and feelings and movement and, you know, all of this kind of stuff. You were taking these words, behavior, behavior. Yeah. yeah you're taking these words and turning it into behavior and, and looking and the students were debating and talking about where the moments were. Then you would discuss it with them and you give them feedback. And then what's beautiful about your class is it's not just conceptual. You would show them the scene that you had directed and they could identify how that turn, those words turn to behavior. Yes. And that's in that particular lecture the, the, the I was using my scene. And as a matter of fact, it was a scene from a series that I did the pilot of and then did the series called My Boys, the one you saw. Mm-hmm. And that actually is the only time in the entire semester that I used my own work. Is that right? Yeah. I feel what, lucky. I got what to see most it. of the what most of the 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 non demonstration time is what, what most of the time is spent with them bringing in their own work mm-hmm. and putting it up. I see. And in that case, I'm guiding and showing and demonstrating where there are moments that they have not seen, mm-hmm. or what is a moment. It's hard to it's hard to explain, but it's very. It's very obvious when it's pointed out to you. Yeah, I think that's right. Once it's pointed out to you. And that's my job, is to point it out. So now you're writing a book. I hope. You're writing something. I'm trying. And you're trying to take what you do in your class. Yeah. And now you're translating it onto a piece of paper. Yes, I'm trying. So you're taking, now what's interesting is this, you're living in a world where for your entire life, you took words from paper and translated it into behavior. <laughs> and now you're faced with the opposite oh where you're taking God. behavior and you're putting it into oh, words. Thanks for putting it that way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's why it's hard for me. It's like, it's like my makes my muscles sore every day. I, I will say this. You're not, you're not a person who complains, <laughs> but over the last few years when I've known you, the one thing where you, you kind of groan a bit is when you talk about your writing. Yeah, it's a monkey on my back. I think the reason and and, and what has happened since we last saw each other, actually, is that I am I am writing quite a bit and fluently, fluidly, I guess would be the word I wanted. So it's not a matter of like I stare at the blank page and there's and I have no ideas. That's not it at all. But, you know, as a director and as a storyteller, 
what you're really trying to do is unearth a structure. Okay. All those words and all the particulars and all that kind of stuff in a certain way are dressing and dressing's important and clothes are important, but the clothes don't go anywhere on unless you have a skeleton mm-hmm. and building that skeleton, building the structure that underlies it, that actually points to what we're doing is hard. Finding the right structure is hard. And that has been a real process in telling this story. Mm-hmm. So you've, you've been experimenting with different structures. Yeah. So I've gone off for a long time in one direction and then say, okay, there's a lot of good stuff here. And I know this stuff is going to be useful somewhere sometime, mm-hmm. but if I just keep going in that direction, I'll, I'll, you know, I'm trying to get to New York and I've got my face pointed towards San Diego and I'll never find New York in that direction. I got to turn around. I got to reorient. Right. That's why I groan. <laughs> I get it. I mean, you know, I think one of the things that's striking about writing is the world's best writers groan <laughs> about writing. I, I, you know, so for me, I, I got serious about fixing my writing 10 years ago. And one of the things that I did, it's kind of classic Pete. I, so one of my things is like, if you want to, if you want to get familiar with something, read a book about it. If you want to get really familiar, and you really want to learn what's going on, read 10 books about it. If you want to become an expert, you do it. Yeah, you know? exactly. And so I started off, I just jumped into 10 books. And one of the very clear, there's two clear messages that come from the world's best writers at least the ones who write about writing. And the one is you need to create a practice. And the second is it's going to be a painful practice. Even for them, they talk about it in that way. You know, is what's the classic like, oh, you want to write something? Sit in front of a typewriter and open a vein. You know, mm-hmm. it's like that, mm-hmm. you know, the doubly, right? It's both going to, it's going to be painful and it's going to have to be come from you. It's not coming from anywhere else. So this is going to happen. It's just a matter of when and how. It's where I put my time yeah. now when I'm not teaching. I mean, I'm doing other things as well. You know, I, I directed a play in New York not very long okay. ago, a new play okay. uh, premiere. And uh, I'm actually going to going back to New York to direct one of the episodes of the reboot of Murphy Brown. Oh, fun. You know, 30 wow. years later, <laughs> which is pretty amazing. Yeah. So, you know, I keep I keep a hand in that way. But but most of my time when I'm not teaching, mm-hmm. I'm uh, trying to figure out this book. Yeah, it's great. Couple things. So obviously you have a lot going on, but you 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 consume, you read, you watch TV, you watch movies, you listen to music. What's what stands out to you right now as like really good? Like not just I mean not just what's good, but like is there something that you're like wow? Yeah. What is the death of Stalin blew my head off? Okay. At- was a fantastic movie. It was the second person who's deadly serious subject Uh treated as all out farce, but organic farce Mm -hmm. based on real human behavior, Mm -hmm. just at, at the fever pitch of farce. Absolutely brilliant, groundbreaking, toughest thing to do in the world, as far as I could tell. Yeah, I haven't Um, seen it. I haven't seen it yet. It's on my list. I've been told that it's a little like in the loop. Which has a, well, it's the same director, same director, and definitely you can see that he has mastered this. Yeah, medium. yeah, he's got this particular ear. But having but applying it to these historical characters with the stakes and the events that we associate with it, mm-hmm. you know, with the purges and you know, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's darker. It, it's darker than in the loop. Which certainly, you know, it's riskier. Yeah, indeed, it's riskier, and 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 to succeed in something that risky is, you know, just amazing. What else? Something else? Well, just right at the moment, I really, uh, I just finished watching Barry on okay. uh, on uh, on HBO. Okay, uh, with Bill Hader. That's a terrific new series. I'm Speaking of train wreck, Bill Hader's in train wreck. That's right. So he is. So he is. It's quite good. Yeah, and to move to another kind of comedy, very. You know, because I'm a comedy imperialist. That's an important thing to know about me. I call <laughs> a lot of things that other people question comedies. But Patrick Melrose. I okay. saw the first episode of Patrick Melrose. I'm not familiar with this. Well, Patrick Melrose is a series of books by an English writer. And really, you would think defy adaptation, but they've got Benedict Cumberbatch doing it on Showtime. Uh, that helps. Huh? And, the, you know, the way to navigate tone in that is something that only a really great comic director can handle. You know, this idea of being a comedy imperialist, it reminds me of, I saw some quote from Quentin Tarantino, who 
he describes he does himself, comedies, by he, the way. He describes himself as a comedy. Well, he's right. Comedy director. He's right, and that's one of my you know big problems. Is I. I, I am tempted to spend too much time arguing with the world about these things, <laughs> but it's not really necessary. Tarantino knows what he's doing and comedy is what he's doing. And he, so is Iannucci. And so, and so are they doing comedy with Patrick Melrose. But if you, a lot of people will watch it and go, what is he out of his mind? Right. The guy is shooting up heroin. His life is a mess. He's been abused. Da, 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 da. Yeah. I'm, um, I'm, I'm in your, I'm on on your side when it comes to this. <laughs> Thank stuff. you. I'm counting on you. <laughs> so, last question: the secret to success, everyone knows but can't seem to do. Tell me, what is it? Oh my! The secret of success is to do it. I mean, there's no question about that. Is to do it and to persevere. Mm-hmm. It, it is what you said. You 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 have to jump off the cliff and develop wings on the way down. Mm -hmm. There's no question. That's really how we learn. The secret of success is to always scare the shit out of yourself. The secret of success is to do the thing that at the moment terrifies you or makes you most uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Not recklessly, but to to do that with eyes open and stay on the edge. It's every time I found that I was getting really good at what I was doing, Mm -hmm. so good that I could sort of go to sleep for a couple of minutes in the course of doing it, take little naps Uh during the day is when I knew I had to make a change. I made a lot of changes in my career. I moved from theater to multi-camera, television to single camera, film back to live audiences, uh, had to develop a lot of different skills and, and, and then, and then to teaching, then to facing, you know, young people again <laughs> yeah. uh, without, you know, makeup. And, um, uh, and in, in each case, it's to be learning, mm-hmm. to be learning, always learning for me is the secret of success. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. It's this interesting thing where you, you're never going to be completely ready to do that thing, because in order to do that thing well, you just have to be doing that thing for a long time and learning how to do that thing. Barnett, thanks so much for doing this. This was great fun. Thanks for having me. It's a real pleasure. It's always fun talking to you. Cheers. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to visit petermcgraw.org for more information about our guest, show notes, and social media links. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and share with others. Join Dr. Peter McGraw next week for another fun fact.